All right. Uh, I will start because some of you might stay home. Um, just a brief review. Right now, we are in the session of energy balance or energy transport. Okay. So far, uh, I gave you two examples. The first one was the conduction. If you recall, the first example in this session is uh, conduction in a metallic rod. So you supply electricity in the rod, and then there's a heat generated, and the heat dissipated toward the outside. And during that example, we consider temperature profile within the solid. So therefore, the transport of energy in that example is only conduction. There's no flow of fluid, okay? Second example I gave you last time was the heat conduction in composite wall. There's a wall of solid stacking three layers. In that case, also consider temperature profile inside the solid. So inside, there's a be conduction only. There's no convection. But in that second example, we also calculated heat transfer from solid wall to the air. But in that time, we used Newton law of cooling. Okay? And we realized that Newton law of cooling was developed just to make things a little bit easier so that we can treat convection as if the equation was conduction. In Newton law of cooling, the convection itself is complicated by nature, so they try to put complicated things together and represent convection in terms of the same equation we use for conduction. So that would be a little bit easier. So we have not considered convection, the real convection at all. Today would be examples giving you ex uh, a detailed calculation regarding convection. Okay. An example is like this, it's a bearing. We have fixed rod, cylindrical rod, and this is fixed, does not move. And then outside, you have sleeves that cover this rod. Within the gap here, there's liquid. It may be oil. And this outside sleeve is moving. This is called liquid ball bearing, li liquid bearing. It, it, would, it is used to reduce friction, okay? Just like ball bearing, but this one is liquid inside. So imagine you have outside sleeve is moving, rotating, and inside here you have liquid, okay? In this particular example, let us assume that temperature of the fixed part is T0 and temperature outside at the plate here or at the sleeve here is TB. The gap between this is B, okay? And we have learned from last section that in this particular example, this is cylindrical coordinate, and normally we put Z axis at the center, this is R, and this is theta, okay? But in this case, if the gap B is so small, much, much smaller than the radius itself, you can imagine that within this zone, it looks like two parallel plates. If the radius of curvature here, the cur curvature is so large comparing to the gap, then you can model this part to be like this. Understand? So this, exam, uh, this assumption can only be applied only when the radius here is so large comparing to the gap size. Just like the Earth. The radius of the Earth is so large comparing to the distance between the ground to the air, or distance between the ground floor to the top floor of the building. We live in very thin layer of the Earth. So we can see that the plate, uh, the floor is flat. 
even though the fact that the Earth is sphere. Okay, so under the same assumption, we will make this particular setup to be like this. A little bit easier because we do not want complicated model at the moment. All right. So therefore, according to to the initial setup, we should have some kind of angular velocity. If you multiply angular velocity with with the radius, you get linear velocity. So if the linear velocity of the outside plate is constant as v b, and the inside floor here is fixed, no velocity. We want to find temperature profile within this liquid phase. Okay, remember temperature down here is T zero, temperature up here is T B. So therefore, there must be temperature profile. So this example contains two transport phenomena. First, there's a movement, so there must be momentum transport. Secondly, there's a temperature difference. So there must there must be energy transport. So two transport phenomenon in one problem. Sounds like fun. All right. And we are still in session of shear balance. Okay. So we will solve the problems using shear balance. Okay. So let us consider. Momentum balance first, okay. If if we decide to solve momentum part first, what does the shell look like? If you recall, you just take examination, right? So you should be able to recall this. In momentum, we have to analyze velocity component. This is rectangular coordinate. I put x and z axis like this. So we have to analyze velocity components, v x, v y, v z. Which one is zero? Which one is non-zero? V z is non-zero for sure, right? V v x. Is velocity going in this direction? Is there any velocity component in that direction? No, no v x. What about v y? V y is going this way. So no v y as well. Okay. Then we have to analyze v z, whether it's function of x, y, or z. Is v z a function of x going in x direction? Can you imagine the change in v z? Of course, here v z is zero, here v z is not. So v z is function of x, right? Is it function of y? So v z is a velocity moving around here. Does it change going perpendicular to the board? No, not function of y. Is it function of z? Z is in this direction. If you go back to original problem, that means it's going in theta direction. So z direction in that particular simplification is basically theta direction in real problems. If velocity is function of zeta, it goes. Let's say if we assume is accelerating, it goes faster, faster, faster. It cannot come back to original velocity, right? So according to symmetry like this, it should not be a function of zeta. If it is not function of zeta in our simplification, it should not be function of z, right? So it's not function of z. So that means velocity components is function of x only, and I told you that if it is function of x, your shell supposed to be thin in x direction, supposed to be full size in y and full size in z. Okay. 
What does it look like? What does the shell look like? It's supposed to be thin in x direction, so your shell supposed to be something like this. This is delta x, full size in z, full size in y, right? So this one is for momentum. What about for energy? For energy, we have to analyze temperature. Of course, temperature is scalar. We don't need to analyze component. There is no component of temperature. There's no T X T Y T Z. There's only one T. So is it function of X, Y, or Z? Does temperature change with respect to X? Going in X direction, does it change? Yes, it is. At least you know that temperature here at the bottom is T0. Going up in X direction, temperature change toward TB. Okay? So it is function of X. Does it change with respect to Y? Y is in direction perpendicular to the board. It does not. Does it change with respect to Z? Similarly, if the whole slave here is TB and the whole rod is T0, the difference in temperature across these gaps is equal all the way throughout this circumference. So therefore, it should not be a function of Z. Okay? Or if you imagine that, let's say, temperature is going higher in direction of the flow, if it goes higher, higher, it cannot go back to original temperature here. It does not go full circles. So it is impossible to do that. It is impossible to have change in temperature in this uh, theta direction. Okay? So if temperature is function of X only, therefore, shell for the energy balance supposed to be thin in X direction, supposed to be full size in Y and C direction. So what does it look like? Again, it looks like this. Okay? So if I draw using red marker, the red one is a shell for energy balance. In this particular problem, both shells are the same. They look the same. But it, is, it does not always be like this. Okay? I will show you later on that some problems, the shell for momentum and shell for energy may look totally different. All right? Now, think about the profile. Not, not, not profile. Think about the transport f first. Uh, when we were in momentum sessions, I always told you that when we have momentum transport, let's start with energy, uh, let's start with equation of continuity. Remember when we were in chapter three? I said always start from equation of continuity and follow with Navier-Stokes equation. Equation of continuity is basically mass balance. Navier-Stokes equation is momentum balance. So I implied during that time that whenever you do, start with mass balance first, and then do momentum balance later, okay? In this case, we have momentum balance and energy balance. Which one should we start first? Do we start from momentum simply because we learn about momentum first? I will show you later on that it is not necessary like that. There is no fixed rule which part should be started first. Okay? 
it depends on problems. You have to analyze that. The correct answer for this kind of question, which one should be done first? The correct answer is basically you have to solve two parts simultaneously. You have to set up equation for momentum, you have to set up equation for energy, and you solve two equations at the same time. Two equations, two unknowns. That's how it should be done. The problem is you have seen equation in momentum by itself is already complicated. If you add equation with function of temperature for another equation, then it would be very complicated. It is impossible to solve it by hand, right? But by computer, of course, if you use software, the software will solve these two simultaneously and you get correct answer. But we are in the class, we cannot do that. At least you cannot do that. So we must use some kind of assumption to solve one part of the equation first and then use that answer plug into the other equation. Okay? I will elaborate a little bit more. If you look into equation for momentum balance, if you consider momentum balance, okay, in your equation, there must be ver V for sure. There, there will be V appears in an equation, right? What else? Of course, there will be coordinate X, Y, and Z appears in the equation. What else? So e equation for momentum balance is basically Navier-Stokes equation, right? So in Navier-Stokes equation, except velocity and coordinate, what else appear in that equation? Pressure. What else? You have density, right? The properties of fluid, density, and viscosity. Of course, there will be time as well. But normally, in steady state problems, time will be disregarded. Okay? Now, think about all these terms or these variables. Which variable can be function of temperature? Of course, coordinate is not function of temperature. Doesn't matter how high temperature would be, coordinates stay fixed. Two things that can change with respect to temperature, density, density is function of temperature for sure. Viscosity is also a function of temperature. Normally for normal liquid, the higher the temperature, the higher, the, the lower the viscosity, right? For density, the higher the, the temperature, the lower the density. These two would change and therefore affects velocity. Okay? Temperature does not affect velocity directly. It affects these two properties. And as a result of the change in these two properties, velocity is changed. Remember, velocity is what we measure. Of course, pressure would change with, with temperature if you imagine ideal gas law. But right now we are using liquid. Pressure of liquid does not change much with temperature, does it? Or if you imagine the flow is done by the means of pressure difference, you can imagine pressure difference to be fixed. If, you, if under the fixed pressure, fixed applied pressure, 
Of course, when you change temperature, velocity change. And the reason that velocity change, because these two variables are change under the same apply fixed pressure. Okay? So we will keep this in mind, but we will not consider pressure at the moment. Okay? What about energy? Energy balance. We have not go into the chapter regarding energy equation yet. But of course, in energy balance, there will be temperature. There will be coordinate. What else? There will be time, which will be disregard for steady state problem. What else should appear in equation for energy? If you recall the balance of energy flux, you need to consider combined flux. And combined flux E is basically conduction flux or Q plus convective transport flux V plus flow work, right? This is combined flux for energy balance, okay? So you can see that in addition to temperature and coordinate, we also have density, density here, density there. We also have velocity, okay? Here, velocity, velocity, and maybe other properties like enthalpy. If you analyze further, you also see that within this tau, if you want to change tau to something else or change tau to velocity, you must use Newton law. So therefore, within this tau, there'll be viscosity as well. Okay, so now you see that, okay, these two are function of temperature, and temperature is function of velocity, right? If you solve red equation, you get temperature as a function of velocity. If you solve blue equation, you get velocity as function of something else. And that something else include temperature. So on one hand, you get V as a function of temperature from momentum balance. On the other hand, you get temperature as function of velocity. Right? So that's why I told you from the very beginning, in order to solve for temperature and velocity, you have to solve two equations at the same time. Now it turns into a system of equations that must be solved simultaneously. Can you see the complication? Yes. Even this single equation for a combined flux is complicated enough. How do we do it? How do we solve the equations? Now you have to somehow separate linking between these two variables by using assumption. If, let's say, if somehow I can find velocity first, I can plug velocity in this equation and solve for temperature. Okay? So one option is somehow to find velocity first and then use velocity to find temperature. Or somehow if I can find temperature first, plug temperature in here, solve it for velocity. That can also be done. Okay? 
which one is closer to reality? It depends on your assumption. In order to take blue approach, it means I will solve or somehow come up with velocity using momentum balance first, and then use velocity that's already solved, plug into equation of energy or energy balance to find temperature. Okay? By doing this, I must make an assumption that density and viscosity here is not, it does not change with temperature much. So imagine this, if I can use momentum balance equation as if, as if the system is isothermal. If the system is isothermal, no temperature change, okay, definitely I can solve for velocity profile. In other words, if I can assume that density does not change with respect to position here, viscosity does not change at all, I can treat this whole system to be isothermal and use whatever we used earlier in momentum session to solve for velocity profile. Then I can get this velocity and plug it back to energy balance to solve for temperature, right? So using this blue approach, it means that for the first half, I would treat my system to be isothermal. In order to do that, the proper assumption is not saying that the system is isothermal. No, it's not. The system is actually non-isothermal. The proper assumption should be stated that these two properties, density and viscosity, does not change much with respect to temperature. So even though the temperature changes, but these two does not change much, the whole system regarding velocity profile can be calculated as if the system is isothermal. Right? Understand? So once I get velocity from calculation of momentum balance, I can plug it in this red equation, find temperature profile. But if I want to do this, the, the second approach, it means I have to find temperature profile first and then plug it back in momentum balance to find velocity profile. What kind of assumption should I use here? You see right now that combined flux is a function of velocity. The only thing that can drop this velocity, the only assumption that can drop this velocity is that convection and the work, the flow work here are not important, are not as important as conduction, okay? So if you assume that convection and flow work are not important or very, very small comparing to conduction, you say that conduction here is very large in number, these two terms are very small, you can drop them. If you drop it, then you get temperature profile using conduction only. Get temperature profile, plug in this, then you get velocity profile. Of course, when you plug in this one, you need thermodynamics, you need correlation, the change in density and viscosity with respect to temperature. Plug it in there, and then you can solve for velocity profile. Which one makes sense? On one hand, you can assume properties that start change with temperature. On the other hand, you can assume convection is really, really small. Of course, it depends on your situation, okay? If this leaf rotates slowly, if it rotates really, really slow, then of course convection is not as large as conduction, 
you can drop convection terms and do the rate approach. But in, in this particular problem, I want to show effects of convection. So under, under this kind of circumstance, I will say that outside slip here is rotate really, really fast. Convection is really dominating. In that case, you cannot use rate approach anymore. Okay? So I'm forcing not to use this one for this particular problem. Okay? But I can say that the temperature T0 and Tb are not so different. Let's say it might be 100 degree different. 100 degree C difference may change density and viscosity by 10, 20%. And you may say that that is not significant. You can ignore that for the moment for the sake of the simplicity of calculation. So in this particular example, we will try to use this approach, okay? So we will decide to do momentum balance first, following by energy balance. Understand? Of course, I will show you another example later on that it's not always like this. Some problems, you have to do temperature profile first and calculate velocity profile later. Okay? So, if we want to do momentum balance first, the shell looks like this. We have Z components of velocity to be non-zero, so there, were, there must be Z momentum flux. And Z momentum flux is changing with respect to X, okay? So now we, you can do the balance of combined flux going in, out, in all directions. Of course, there will be going in and out like this. This is phi xz, right? Going in, xz going out. There will be zz going in and zz going out. For y direction, let's ignore it. This is two-dimensional problems at the moment, okay? If you do this, just like in the examination, you can end up with velocity profile. I don't have to do it for you right now because it is very simple. You can imagine that this is like our first derivative or derivation for Newton law. If you have fixed wall and moving wall, the velocity profile should be linear like so. Right? So this line is basically velocity Vz as a function of x. And that can be solved by using shear balance like this. Okay? So this velocity Vz, if you solve it properly, you should get Vz equal to Vb times x over b. Okay? So from here, setting up the shear balance to here, velocity profile, of course, you have to set flux in and out, set the balance, change the flux into velocity using Newton law, integrate it twice, you end up like this. So I'm not going to show you this detail anymore. It is simple enough, okay? So if we get this part done, that means velocity here is already known. Then we can start doing energy balance. For energy balance, now we consider red shell. There's supposed to be energy flux going in going out. Of course, there'll be combined flux E in which direction? E here is X, Y, or Z.
Now you see that as we analyzed earlier, temperature changes with respect to x. Temperature is function of x. So there must be profile, uh, not profile, there must be energy transport in x direction. Okay? So there will be Ex here. Please notice this is vector, so I use one single arrow. This is tensor, I use double arrows. Okay, and this is only one direction of the tensor, it's a transfer direction. Of course, your tensor here, suppose you go like this. Okay? Now, if I do the balance for energy, the input term for energy going in, that's supposed to be the flux multiplied by the area perpendicular to the flux. If I call the distance in z direction to be L, the distance in y direction to be w, so that would be flux times wl. Okay? Output term would be exactly the same because the shell looks the same in the input side and output side. There will be wl in both sides. The only difference would be the flux itself is located at x plus delta x. Okay, going in at x, going out at x plus delta x. If you plug it in, the balance, you end up with WL times E of x minus E of x plus delta x. Do we have external force? In the balance of energy, we need four terms, right? In, out, and force by gravity, and energy production. Remember? Force by gravity is basically work from external force, and energy production is basically work, non-mechanical work, like electricity. In this pro problem, we did not apply anything else except rotation, so there is no electricity, no energy production term. What about gravity term? Do we need to include that part? Do we need to include that? Think about that. Gravity term in our balance is a work by external force, right? Should we include that in this e equation? Do we have external force? On one hand, you might think without, e e without external force, this plate will never move. This plate is moving simply because you apply force, right? So should we include external force term? On the other hand, you should also realize it moves with velocity, and that velocity is already included. If it is already included, does it mean that the work associated with making it move is already counted? Which one is correct? Think about this, like this, if you're confused, okay? Simply consider this. In transport phenomena, Okay, for equation of shear balance, the work, external work term, you consider effects of gravity only. Just effects of gravity. 
if you think gravity causes something in your system, then you include the external work term. If it does not affect anything, you neglect that. Just like in this problem, the flow is going in this direction without effects of gravity at all. So it does not include the gravity term. So for simplicity, to make things easier, do not be confused that the external term, external work term, do not be confused. Just call that term to be gravity term. Okay. The third term is gravity term. You just consider whether gravity affects anything in your system. Okay. In this particular problem, the work applied to make this thing move is already included in convection term. Is in is already included in flow work term actually. So we don't need anything else. Just in and out. No effects of gravity. No electricity. That would equal to zero as steady state. Okay, so WL can be dropped. You divide the whole equation by delta x, taking limit delta x approaching zero, you will end up with dx by dx equal to zero. Of course, minus here occurs because I start with x minus x plus delta x. If you swap, you get minus to be gone. So this would be eliminated easily. Okay. If you integrate this equation, basically it means the combined flux is constant. Let me call this one C1. All right, now we know that the combined flux is constant, and this is combined flux in three-dimensional. If I write EX, basically it's equal to X component of this vector. This combined flux is vector, there are three components. So if I write EX, that's first component of this vector, okay? So that means you just write x component of all vectors here. Qx is x component of Q, of course. x component of second term, basically Vx. Okay? It's supposed to be Vx. Because everything in parentheses here is scalar. So here, whatever we have here must be the same. I told you from very beginning that this velocity is scalar. This is magnitude of velocity, magnitude of net velocity. So even though we want to write x component, the whole thing within the parentheses remains the same. Okay? The third term, you basically split this Basically, if you want x component, the first subscript of tau must be x. And then you vary from xx, xy, xz, multiplied by vx, vy, vz. Okay? So now I can erase this. Then Qx can be calculated using Fourier law. Fourier law says Qx equal to minus K dt by dx. Or you can say that Fourier law here is Q 
is equal to minus k del t. So therefore, x component would be minus k dt by dx. Okay? Del is basically differentiation with respect to x, y, and z. And in this problem, only in this problem, temperature is function of x only. So therefore, I can change partial differentiation to total differentiation. What about this term? How do we write it? Do we need to know enthalpy? If you realize now Vx is zero, right? If you recall, we said earlier Vx is zero, Vy is zero, Vc is function of x from very beginning. So x component of velocity is zero. This convective term does not count. In detail, you say that this combined flux or combined energy flux is in x direction, is consisted of conduction in x direction, convection in x direction, and work. There is no convection in x direction simply because velocity is not going in x direction. Okay? Now, therefore, this term is zero. Vy is zero as well. Vz is not zero. What about tau z? Tau xz. Tau xz can be calculated based on Newton law. That's minus mu dvz by dx plus dvx by dz. That's Newton law. Okay? And we know that vx here is zero. So at the end, you get ex equal to minus k dt by dx plus mu vz times dvz by dx. Of course, I can change partial differentiation to total differentiation because now vz is function of x only. Okay? So if I combine this part with the integration that we got, you get this whole thing to be C1. Yes? Oh, yeah. Minus. Thank you. Because of this minus. Okay. Thank you. So let us keep this as first equation. Right? Now, how do we solve this? Of course, if you consider this part, if you integrate the equation, you can get temperature. How can we integrate this equation? How can we solve this ordinary differenti differential equation? If you analyze this, if you look at this part, of course, integration gives you temperature as function of x if you know velocity. Do we know velocity? Yes, according to velocity profile. So if we plug velocity vz equal to vb times x over b that we obtained from doing momentum balance earlier, we can plug this, differentiate it, 
and then you get simple equation. Okay? So, from this equation, if you take differentiation with respect to x, you end up with vb over b. Plug it back in that equation one, So I get this part minus mu vz times vb over b, right, equal to c1. Of course, this vz must be changed as well. So if I change this VZ to VB X over B, according to this, whatever we have in this term is not velocity profile anymore. VB is no number. X will be integrated, right? So if you integrate this equation, you get temperature as a function of X. That's temperature profile. So this minus mu. Now you get VB squared over B time X. No, square would be outside. Equal to C1. All right? If you look, the first part comes from Fourier law. So by the meaning, this part would be conduction. The second part is additional term by means of the flow. So this combines convective transport as well as the flow work, okay? Actually, it would be flow work, not convective transport, because convective transport in x direction is already eliminated. This is flow work, okay? Sometimes this term is called viscous heat. It's heat generated from work. So in the same, I mean, in the plain word, this is energy created by friction. Just like when you rub your hands together really fast, it warms up by means of friction. So if fluids is moving against each other really, really fast, the movement is translated to heat, right? In plain words, is heat. In thermodynamics, basically you apply works. The works created, or the works is energy added to internal energy. The higher internal energy, the higher the temperature. Okay? So basically this one is an increase in energy by means of flow work. So the higher the flow, the higher the, this term, the more important of this term. This term would be important by two means. First, velocity is supposed to, really, to be really fast. Or viscosity would be really large. Okay? So viscous heat would be important only in two cases. Velocity is real fast or viscosity is real large. The extreme examples of really large velocity causing the increase in temperature is when you have spaceship, space shift going back to Earth. What happens? It burns into flame, right? Why it burns? When you have meteorites enter atmosphere, it burns. Why? Everybody said it's friction. Friction with air. 
But if you analyze thermodynamically, it's not friction at all. The movement is so fast. The if I mean, if you fix your coordinate onto the meteorite, it seems like the flow is going into the meteorite, right? That flow contains flow works. The higher the velocity, the higher the flow works. That flow works is translated to internal energy. So the higher the flow work, the higher the internal energy. The higher the internal energy, the higher the temperature. Okay, so basically it's a transfer of energy from flow to internal energy and temperature, which is indication of internal energy increase. So the velocity, if it is extremely fast, this viscous heat would be important. So meteorite entering atmosphere is caused by this viscous heat term. Okay? Another practical term that you might see viscous heat dominating is when you extrude polymer through very small dye. You learn in engineering materials, in order to squeeze polymer into fibers, you have to put it through extruder, okay? Under extrusion, viscosity is so high, temperature will be increased. Same thing. Understand? So, on the other hand, you might make this equation simple, just to say that if our velocity is not large enough, our viscosity is not very large, you can neglect the whole term, then it turns into conduction. Okay? But for this particular example, I say that the velocity is so important, this term stays. All right? So if I rearrange this viscous heat to the right-hand side, I get minus K dt equal to C1 plus viscous heat term dx. Okay? That would equal to if you integrate it, you get minus k t. First term, integration should give you C1x plus mu Vb over B square x square over 2, right? This is integration of the second term. And then, since we integrated without boundary, we need integration constant. If I divide the whole equation by minus k, and I take this term first over k, vb over b square, x square over 2, minus c1x over k, plus C2 over K. All right. There are two unknowns here, two integration constants, C1 and C2. In order to find them, you need two boundary conditions. The first boundary is supposed to be temperature, right? This equation, you should know temperature at particular X. So we know two temperatures, T0 and Tb. First boundary would be at x equal to 0. T is equal to T0. 
So x equal to zero, this term will be gone, this term will be gone. That means C2 over K is T0. Oh, this is supposed to be minus, I'm sorry. Because we take minus from the left-hand side here. So it means T0 is equal to minus C2 over K from the first boundary. From the second boundary, at x equal to B, temperature is TB. Okay? If you rearrange the equation, you end up with C1 over K equal to the whole thing here. Okay? Now, if I say that temperature TB is larger than temperature T0, if T0 is here, let's say TB is here, okay? So on one boundary, temperature is T0, on the other, out the other boundary, temperature is TB. What would the temperature profile look like? Should it be linear? According to that equation, it is not linear. You can see temperature, I'm sorry, you can see x squared, x squared here, right? So the function is nonlinear. Is there any chance that temperature is larger than TB? Is there any chance? Without looking at temp uh, without looking at the equation, by your common sense, can temperature of the fluid be higher than temperature of the boundary? According to your common sense? Think about it according to thermodynamics. If you fix temperature on both boundaries, but you apply some kind of work into the liquid, can the liquid has higher temperature than the boundaries? Yes, it can if you apply enough work, right? Applying work means applying energy. The higher the, ha the energy applied, the higher the temperature. So if the flow work here is high enough there's a chance that your fluid would have temperature higher than the boundary. Of course, in reality, in order to make these two boundaries constant, you need some kind of cooling, right? In reality, to state that this temperature is fixed, this temperature is also fixed, you need some kind of cooling. Otherwise, when you apply some work, this temperature would increase gradually. Okay, so you need cooling here, you need cooling there, but you apply work inside, temperature can't go like this. That's temperature profile. Of course, you can obtain temperature profile mathematically by plugging C1 and C2 in this equation. Then you get the look at it. So if you plug that in, you get T equal to minus mu over K, VB over B square, X over two, X squared over two, minus 
please note that I keep C1 over K here because it is here. Okay? So 1 minus, this is also minus, here turns to be plus. X over B, TB minus T0, plus mu over K, VB squared over 2. And also C2 minus K here is equal to T0. So that would be T0. So if I move T0 to the left-hand side and manipulate equation a little bit, eventually I will get T minus T0 over TB minus T0. you end up with this equation. Basically, you take T0 here to the left-hand side, divide everything by T, TB minus T0, and rearrange the term. The reason we move T0 to the left-hand side and divide by temperature is that the whole term here has no unit. It becomes dimensionless. So that means if you can see this germ is also dimensionless, this is dimensionless, dimensionless. That means this term must be dimensionless. Okay? If you look at the unit, viscosity has unit of Pascal second, velocity square is meter square per second square. K has unit of watt per meter Kelvin, and temperature would be Kelvin. Okay? Pascal is Newton per meter square. Watt is joule per second, and joule is Newton per Newton meter. So joule per second means Newton meter per second. Right? Newton cancel out. Second cancel out. You have second here, second over there. You have Kelvin cancel out. So eventually you will see that the whole red terms cancel out it becomes dimensionless. This whole term is what we call Brinkman number. Or sometimes it stands for BR. Brinkman number tells you how important the viscous heat term is. If in your system, Brinkman number is high, then the viscous heat is dominating. So just like meteorite entering atmosphere, in that case, Brinkman number is really, really large. Then you get something burn up like that. If Brinkman number is low, then you can ignore viscous heat term equation in this particular problem turns to conduction only. All right? Any question? So as a summary, uh, summary for today, 
I give you examples. What I want from these examples is several things. First, this is examples show you how important the flow work term would be. If the flow work is dominating, it can affect temperature. Okay. This example, I want also to show you how to set up equation, how to weigh between momentum balance and energy balance, which one should be done first. You have to analyze that. I need, I want you to see from these e examples that it must be solved. Actually, in theory, it must be solved simultaneously. But in practice, we have to choose to start. How do we choose? I will show another examples next time on the other case that we have to do energy balance first, followed by the momentum balance. It depends on situation. All right. Lastly, this example introduce that term, the Brinkman number, the importance of viscous heat term. So later on in other examples, I may say right away that if I assume bring uh, if I assume the viscous heat is negligible, then the whole term regarding flow work will be dropped. Understand? All right. Any question? So if you don't have question, I don't have time to start another example. Let us call it a day. Okay, see you Thursday.